Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Smart Money. Now, in June of 2023, Fortune magazine put out a report saying that in the US, Gen Z is investing younger than any past generation and 80% of Gen Zers are investing their money before they hit the age of 20. In India, 27% of India's population comprises of Gen Zers as we call it. So today we've decided to talk about investments in India for the younger generation. What are the resources that Gen Zers can use to start their journey and what are the cornerstones of building a good portfolio? Ravi Dharamshi joins me now. He's the founder and CIO of ValueQuest Investment Advisors. Ravi has, I think, uh, what? over two decades of experience in the market, in the capital markets, and he joins in now to help us understand and give us a masterclass on how to start your investment journey. Ravi, thanks a lot for joining us on the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So, you know, we have a new generation of investors, right? The Gen Z investors, as we call them. What are the things to get right for an aspiring do-it-yourself investor? No, I think, uh, so first of all, I think it's a great thing that India is a young nation and uh, one thing that Warren says is that, you know, he started investing at the age of 11 and he was a little late. So that means at, at least these guys are tight, uh, starting at the right time. I am 45 today. I probably started at 22, 23. I should have also started earlier. So starting early is the most important thing. But to get, uh, you know, become a right, correct, uh, do-it-yourself investor, you need a correct mindset. You need correct mentors. And uh, you need to develop certain uh, level of uh, uh, correct books and uh, you have to read and uh, become a learning machine. So this, this, I believe, are what is required to become a true do-it-yourself investor. A very broad set of uh, uh, requirements for becoming an investor. So the good thing is investing is the last art of, you know, last liberal art, is, as Robert Hagstrom has written a book on it. What it essentially means is that just by your intellectual power, you can make money. And you don't even need to have great amount of money to start off. So this is where uh, people can actually improve their lives over a long period of time. And uh, investing definitely falls in under that last liberal art. You know, we're having a very interesting discussion. I was having with Gautam Dugard of Motila Doswal. Now, uh, Titan, of course, as we know, has hit 3 lakh crore market cap. And in 2003, right, if you had invested 1 lakh rupees in Titan, today you would be sitting with, uh, I think, 6 crores or so in your account. That's the kind of wealth you would have made. And Gautam was telling me that, oh, in 2003, I was busy putting that money in my MBA. So that, that's the kind of opportunity cost, right? Correct. But for such young investors, what is needed to make money in the market? So, but... Uh understanding that such kind of opportunity exists is the first step towards it. See, what is needed is, of course, you need the vision uh, to see, then you need the fortitude to hold, and you need the courage to capitalize. What do I mean by this? You know, if somebody in, in 2003 had told me that I, I can see the future clearly, and this is what is going to happen in to Titan 20 years down the line, still I would not have made that much money. Why? Because, you know, uh, this journey is not one way up. There have been at least 10 corrections of more than 10, 20% in Titan. There have been two corrections of more than 50% and one correction of 80%. How do you live through that? How do you build the conviction to buy more and not panic? That requires a different level of fortitude, different level of courage. And that comes only through doing your own research, doing your own, having that own conviction that this is the company, uh, they, have the, they are in the right market, they have the right management, who's guiding the ship through the tough times and they will come out trumps eventually. So that kind of conviction is required for you to be able to capitalize on that. This, uh, many people knew it, but there's only one person who actually capitalized on Titan, right? So that's what the story is. And one more thing I would just like to add is that for, uh, you know, even without Titan, you could have bought something else. There are many ways to achieve Nirvana over here. There is no one <laughs> single way. So. That's the beauty of uh, investing, that uh, if you uh, pick any 10 great investors in this market, the winners for them have been completely different. Yes. So that tells you that you can also do it, but you have to have that level. What, what did these people have and what did they do right that you can copy from or learn from or mm. inspire from, as I would say. So it's available to anyone and every, uh, everyone. So the big lesson from Titan, according to me, is that find companies which have A, a moat, B, you know, st of course, strong leadership, good corporate governance, low debt, and, you know, are in a growing industry, right? So how does one do that? What are the salient skills that one needs, the intangibles that one needs in order to, um, you know, sort of identify such gems? So 
fundamental uh, analysis is the step one. What are all the steps that you mentioned about great management, corporate governance, big opportunity size. So we have something called a scale framework. What we like to do is identify companies that can scale up. You know, the biggest hurdle where most companies falter is that they don't scale up as much. Many companies have a short spurt, short growth phase, but then those industries go through a maturity curve and they don't end up becoming uh, like Titan. So there is a lot of survivorship bias built into the uh, success stories. For every Titan, there is probably a Unitech that failed. For every, uh, every success story, there are 10 failure stories out there. So what are the key ingredients that go into the, the three things that matter are uh, persistent, uh, profitability, sustainability. Uh, so that is what we need to achieve. Uh, over a, uh, what you need to see is, is that company becoming a cash flow generating machine which can sustain itself over a long period of time. We have to give the uh, equity the power of compounding and the power of compounding curves if your period of holding is longer and your period of holding can be longer if that company is uh, day in and day out working towards sustaining their competitive edge or the moat as you called it. The thing is moat is not static, moat can also go up and down also so you have to understand which is the company that is actually gaining uh, competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis the others. Okay. So, uh, for example, Bajaj Finance is another example. You know, 15 years back, hardly anybody spoke about Bajaj Finance. Today, Bajaj Finance is a giant. Absolutely. So, they have become that cash flow throwing machine. And it doesn't matter what I say, it is easier said than done. In hindsight, it looks very easy. You know, we should have identified the moat and this and that. But when somebody invested in Titan, or for that matter, Aishar Motors, uh, in Titan, it used to be a watch company in 2003. 2023, it's a jewellery company. Mm. So, that it is only by, uh, if you knew that there is a management that can identify the upcoming trends and capitalize on that opportunity while maintaining the balance sheet and keeping highest levels of corporate governance. It's a, one thing you have to understand is that investing is a probabilistic game. Mm. You will never be 100% right. There is nothing called a certainty over here. But you can put the odds in your favor. So a lot of people also think, you know, stock market is gambling. But what is different from gambling over here is in gambling, your odds don't change. If you're betting on a roulette table, your odds are 1 is to 35. The house always wins, yeah. And the house always keeps a cut over there. But over here, you can actually improve your odds of winning by making understanding what are the drivers of the growth, what are the drivers of success, and are those ingredients present in the stock uh, uh, company that you are looking at. So do you have any such stories and I want to put a disclaimer that these are not stock recommendations but any of these stories where you know you would have invested some money with say your first salary in one stock and that stock would have compounded you know substantially over the years. Yeah I'm, I've been I'm lucky enough to have such stories uh, in fact uh, one of the company that I had invested when I was uh, still working with Rakesh ji uh, in way back in 2005 we had invested in a pharma company called uh, Concord Biotech okay. uh, and that company it, it was actually he was uh, seeding an entrepreneur who was uh, trying to uh, make his own mark in the field and uh, we, we would have invested in that company when it was barely 50 crores market cap 50, and uh, today now it is listed on the markets and it is quoting at about roughly 13 14 thousand crores market cap wow. and I am still lucky enough to be a shareholder in that. I have sold about one third of my holding uh, when a private equity player came in about five, six years back. But uh, I still continue to own two thirds of my holding and it's compounded at roughly some 36, 37% if I'm not mistaken. 36, 37 uh, times you mean? No, percent compounding. Oh, so compounding. that's the beauty of compounding. Okay, 36, 37% okay. becomes almost 200x in 20 years time. Oh wow, that's phenomenal. So the 35, 36% doesn't sound good, uh, doesn't sound great when you look at it from one year perspective. Uh, but the power of compounding comes Especially through. when you have so many stories where stocks double in a year's time or even three, four X in a year. But it's the beauty of compounding, beauty of time horizon. It's the sheer uh, thing that I held it on for 20 years is what has made me the money. And not that I was very smart about it. I was lucky, <laughs> I was in the right place, right time. I got uh, allotted some shares 
and I'm still holding on to it is the reason why I'm making money. Okay, you know, uh, the one thing that the younger generation has that we don't have is time, right? They, so th they may not have the skill set, but time will sort of make up for all of that. Sure. So how does the viewer who's watching us today, how does one look for mega trends in this market and capitalize on that using time? No, I think that's a brilliant point. Uh, not many people think of the market in that way. People look for bottom-up ideas where, you know, this is a good company and it will do good over a long period of time. But there are times when uh, you actually need to identify which are the themes, sectors that can do well over the next five, 10 years. Like for example, if you had identified technology way back in uh, late 90s and you would have gotten into a company like Infosys or we have heard so many stories about Wipro where people, uh, you know, when Azim Premji, when he was having some uh, issue with uh, cash, as in he was facing some cash crunch, he actually went to his dealers and told them, you keep some shares and uh, you know what, don't worry about it, I'll pay you when time comes. And those shares have gone on to become uh, worth hundreds of crores. So there are so many such stories, identifying IT in late, 20, uh, late 90s, identifying pharmaceuticals in early 2000s, identifying chemicals is as uh, late as 2014-15, identifying uh, 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 railway defense stocks, three years back, those were, those are the kind of opportunities where your wealth can multiply multifold. Even so an from entire here, sector is 10, 20x, your best winner can be 100x also. So from here, if you had to identify some mega trends, and you know, based on your research, what would they look like? So I'll tell you one, there is a huge mega trend panning out, which is energy transition. Mm. I think the world is moving away from fossil fuel towards renewables. Now, the way the power is generated is changing. The way the power is consumed is changing. And in between, the way the power is going to be transmitted is also changing. Because the earlier, the, in the energy mix, for example, coal and uh, crude had a big part, which is the fossil fuel. But uh, uh, of course, uh, the thermal power plant uh, ha is a very stable source of power plant. Now, as compared to that, uh, wind or uh, nuclear or uh, solar mm. are not so stable and are not so consistent. Nuclear might be, but solar and wind are not. So. Uh, solar, for example, generates wind uh, uh, power only during daytime. Wind generates only during nighttime. So that is very different. So, but you have to still build capacity for transmitting at the peak level. So, if you are putting up a one gigawatt solar solar plant, it generates only uh, 250 megawatt. It doesn't generate full one gigawatt. While a power plant, uh, sorry, thermal power plant would generate about 80, 90 percent of its capacity. So uh, the, everything is changing in the field of energy and there is, whenever this happens, usually the way we like to play any particular large uh, theme is to find picks and shovel sellers. See, whenever there is a gold rush, now this is in, in the late 1800s, when there was a gold rush in California, people had gone to dig gold and they were finding uh, gold in the river. Whether people found gold or no, we don't know. But the guys who were selling the shovels yeah. <laughs> definitely made a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> so that is how you should be thinking about it. If there is a large trend that is happening, you have to find who are the picks and shovel sellers. Eventually, uh, renewable energy will become part of it and well, the power generator will make money or no, we don't know. But the guys who are selling the equipment to them will surely make we'll money. Definitely so make that's money. how we think about uh, mega trends and how to play them. And that's perhaps why the Tata Tech IPO got sold out on day one itself, right? Subscribed within minutes or within hours of it opening because True. it it's supplies a to a sector in, which is electric yeah, it vehicles. it plays yeah. on electric vehicle. Yeah. So electric vehicle is a theme. Uh, now, sure, there are bumps along the way. There could be flex fuel vehicles or we don't know which way the technology is going to emerge or no. But one thing is for sure that our cars that we drive are becoming more and more software. They are not anymore uh, mechanical. So we are moving from mechanical to uh, softwareization of the car. And in that, companies like Tata Tech have a much bigger and larger role to play automatically. So, and they have an in-house customer, of course, which is their group company. And uh, they can actually uh, scale you know, up on that. Scale yeah, up in scale a big up, way. Yeah. So that is why it is getting the kind of valuation mm -hmm. that it is getting. And it, it is a part of the larger uh, trend of, of both the trends. One trend is the EV and other trend is the softwareization of the... Okay, well, this is a very interesting discussion and we have a powerhouse of ideas here, Ravi Dharamji, but we need to take a short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back in just moments from now.
Welcome back to Smart Money. We are in conversation with Ravi Dharamshi, founder and CIO at ValueQuest Investment Advisors, and we're discussing all the tools that you need in order to uh, build your portfolio. So, Ravi, everyone keeps talking about the word moat, right? For the uninformed, how does one find the moat of a business? See, there are few sources of moat that any business has. First, explain to us what is moat. Okay, <laughs> moat is essentially uh, when two companies are competing with each other, one company has an advantage over the other company. What kind of an advantage? Either their cost of production is lower, so they are able to price things lower, or there is a network effect that is pl taking place. For example, today if you are on WhatsApp and your friend is on WhatsApp, automatically your entire network has to be on WhatsApp. Or when, we, when it started out, the mobile penetration, there was a time when you could uh, call from you know, uh, Reliance to Reliance free. So then that started having network effect. The, your uh, exit costs are very high. So for example, today if you have a particular set-top box in your uh, house, uh, it's you are a little lethargic, and when I say cost, it's not. It doesn't cost you anything. Even after uh, you know number portability has come into the mobile phone, but not many people are switching from one network to another. I think is it familiarity bias, right? Familiarity bias or lethargy that creeps in, or inertia, whatever you call it. That once you are set, you you will not change it unless there is a dramatically improved product or solution that is in the market. Then uh, there is. Uh, uh, in some R&D, innovation-led mode. So all these are the sources of uh, advantages that, for example, for a finance company, it could be the cost of funds. Mm -hmm. Because of the way your size, because of the way you access the market, you are able to borrow at 1% cheaper than your competitor. That's a huge source of advantage. You can actually deploy that 1% in increasing your uh, moat elsewhere. You will get the best talent, you will have the best technology, your customer's experience will be best, you will be able to offer rates which are lower. So those are the things that uh, a company can, companies do to increase their moat. So those are the sources of moat and I, honestly, it is more anecdotal and there, you will not find it in a research report. You have to experience it yourself. In fact, the best uh, identification of moat is when you experience, experience it yourself. You know, a business which is actually pushing you away, but you are still not able to get away from it are the best kind of moat. Let I'll, me I'll say, give, for I'll example, give you an example. Hospitals or schools, <laughs> yeah. for example. Uh, you know, even if a uh, school says, we, you know, we are going to charge you 10% more, 20% more, 30% more, we will, you will still plead, especially in a place like uh, South Bombay, yeah. uh, where please take my child into the school. <laughs> so that is that is the power that the business has uh, in terms of uh, charging. So I have an example here as well. Sure. What happened with Vodafone? I was a Vodafone user for the longest time. True. Even when they had 1,000, 10,000 crores of debt and I knew the company was sinking, I refused to change because I was so happy with the service but provider. This will change. This will change when there is true 5G. Yeah. And if, uh, for example, now again, we, we don't own Vodafone or there is mm. dis standard disclaimer and everything. But if the entire network moves to 5G, there will be a substantial difference between Vodafone and others. And if mm. Vodafone doesn't have the money to invest for 5G, then uh, they will start witnessing uh, subscribers Absolutely. moving away. So if as long as there's a status quo and the two products are exactly the same, then there is a uh, inertia to moving away. Mm. But if there is a substantially improved experience, then people will move away. Now, eventually I did move. I, I shifted. <laughs> Just want to make that clarification. But you know, Ravi, I get asked a lot from the younger generation about what are the key books that I can read before I start you know, my portfolio, start my investment journey. What are the three or four books that you would recommend? So before recommending a book, uh, what I would like to say is that, you know, it is not about reading hundreds and hundreds of books. It is about reading the right book and learning the right lessons. And if you reread re those 10, 15, 20 books, that is good enough. So if you start with a wrong book, you will actually maybe not like investing at all. So, you know, Security Analysis is by Benjamin Graham is a great book, but I don't recommend to a first time investor, go and read this. Most likely he will get bored of the investing and he will never come back to it again. So I usually give uh, the f entry level book that I recommend is uh, Peter Lynch, One Up on Wall Street. That I believe is the best entry level book because it uh, actually makes you like the subject. Uh, and that is where, uh, and then you have to of course get into the business history, the equity valuations, all those things come later. One more thing that I highly recommend is a book like, uh, uh, you know, Manias and Manias, Panics and Crashes or uh, Reminences of a Stock Operator. Because see, a lot of investing is also about the, your uh, 
uh, emotional ride. You know, markets actually, uh, you, humans are emotional beings and uh, market going up makes you happy and market going down makes you sad. So, and fear and panic and ultra greed is also part of the cycle. So, if you have read about it, if you have seen others go through that emotional cycle, you'll hopefully be in better control of your own emotions. So, when everybody is losing their head, you will keep your own. So, this is, uh, I think that is why a little bit of understanding of the market history is important. And little bit of your spiritual journey is also important, right? Absolutely. Because I think the biggest thing in the market is controlling your fear. Yes. And how would you sum up that Controlling emotion? both greed and fear. Greed so and fear. let's say this is the line where it's greed and this is fear. You have to ensure markets will transcend greed and will, uh, you know, on the other side, create panics. You have to ensure you don't participate in that ultra greed and uh, don't participate in that ultra panic. Those times, even though you're not supposed to time the market and time in the market is more important than the timing. But what you do at those uh, ultimate greed uh, point and ultimate panic point determines a lot of the outcome. So you have to have that the most important uh, you know organ in a human body that is important for investing is your gut. It is your ability to withstand the market extremes because more often than not everybody gets swayed by what's happening in the market. So you have to be able to hold your own and I think that is why reading about is, in, is important and experiencing that is also important. That is why Time, uh, people, those who have two years, two decades of experience, count a lot because you would have gone through uh, dot com. Many cycles. Yeah, many. I mean, crazy, crazy kind of manias and uh, panics also. Dot com bust, uh, global financial crisis, COVID, COVID. Those kind of things really test your emotions. Absolutely. And I've myself been in this market for over 15 years and I've seen the biggest ups and the lowest downs of this market. So I take your point entirely. Ravi, very, very informative and, you know, educational, uh, uh, you know, last half an hour. So thank you so much for joining us on thank Smart you so Money. Much. My pleasure. Okay, with that, it was a complete masterclass on how you should start your financial journey. Keep writing to us. We love receiving feedback from you. Until we meet again, happy weekend.